Remembering the Bard of Dundee, we celebrate the late Michael Mara next. Humour with Andy Parsons gruntled live in half an hour. Now on BBC Two Scotland, a tribute to the singer, songwriter, performer and director, Michael Mara. Signs of life on the other side of Fife And the devil's tune on the dark side of the noon I think he's a unique talent, a Scottish national treasure. You could be out in the street and on your own Just like another rolling stone A Republican, socialist, Scottish bard of the highest level of quality. There's love in this world for everyone. Every rascal and son of a gun. Michael is probably the cleverest person I've ever met. In my disorder, the Galsatian fag, and it's moved a few tattoos. Barking at the laundry and on its feet were pointed shoes. It went by face to his gigs. Oh, no more will I rove, no more, it's done. He had his keyboard on an iron board. It was kind of propped there, like as if, oh, where else would he have his keyboard? He made me really proud of Scotland. The EP House Room was recorded in early 2012 by Michael Mara and the Hazy Janes, the band featuring his children Alice and Matthew. Went in January and recorded six songs in just a few days and it was amazing fun. Um, I think we really enjoyed the experience of getting to work with him in the studio but I think he also really enjoyed working with us and you know, he was quite impressed by what we were doing and we were impressed by him and, and we had lots of laughs as well, lots of laughs. The few performances which followed would be Michael Mara's last. From early days in Dundee's Loch Hee, this was a life filled with music. Michael's older brother, Eddie, played piano. Everyone always says he was the far superior piano player of the two. Um, and Christopher played guitar. I know there was a lot of classical music in the house, a lot of Duke Ellington. And he was obviously surrounded by music. He was an altar boy, um, and he has a fabulous song called The Altar Boys. He did talk a lot, didn't he, about his experiences of being in the church and being an altar boy. He loved the hymns, I yeah, think. Yeah, he loved hymns. Said they were hits, sounded like hits. Sounded like hit songs, that's right, yeah. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord hath chastened me sore, but he hath not given me over unto death. Michael himself had something of a hit with Psalm 118 when he recorded it with techno folk musician Martin Bennett. The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Folk clubs were where he first started, although if you'd called him a folk singer in these days, he would not have been happy. Well, I know that he turned up to the, the folk club at the Woodlands and asked if he could play. I think he played a song to someone and said, have you got any more like that? He said, oh yeah, hundreds. Michael and brother Christopher were for a time part of a group called Hen's Teeth, which featured musician Doogie McLean. The subject of this song, Neil Gow's Apprentice. I'll sit beneath the fiddle tree with the ghost of Neil Gow next to me. Listen, Neil, the apprentice has begun. Dougie was in Australia at, at the time Michael wrote the song, so that experience and, and Dougie are threaded through 
the lyric of, of the song, but there's much more to it than that. I'll sit beneath the fiddle tree with the ghost of Neil Gow next to me. Listen, Neil, the apprentice has begun. And it's just got all of those elements, the strengths of Michael's songwriting. It's a bit something very specific on the one hand, but is layered and has that kind of blossoming that makes it resonate in a far, far wider context. Oh, no more will I rove, no more it's By the mid-70s, both Mara brothers were in Skeet's Bolivar, playing a blend of country, rock and soul. One of the first guys I was playing music with said, this is band, it's a big band, you know? They've got two saxophones and lots and lots of players. I woke up late when time began. And Michael, he was the bass player in the band. I can always remember he, where he stood and I remember the, the dungarees that he used to wear. The skeets were something very special. There was a professional quality about the band that was very different. The covers that they did were classic kind of songs, great material, but what particularly was great about them was the original thing that they did. They did their own thing, and that was very different in Dundee at the time. They all had a certain confidence as well, I think, I liked about Skeets as well. They were all happy to be there, and I couldn't say that with every performer that I looked at. Were you living there when you wrote that? In Perry Street, aye, yes, I was. Was it drink at the West End bar? I did a couple of times, but I know if I could help it. It was rough. It was rough. Yeah, but I mean, when you were staying there, you were, what, you were just, were you working at the time? No. No. So on the brew. In 1976, the band won a recording contract after coming second in a competition run by the Sunday Mail. The resulting single, on which the official title, Street House Door, bears little resemblance to the actual words, was not a commercial success. Commercial success needs so many elements and it eludes the majority of, of, of people. Um, so it, it's not wise to actually go after that and, and that alone. With the attractions of constant touring wearing thin and a second single no more successful than the first, Michael was keen to pursue his songwriting. Artistic success, Michael was always destined to something there. He was a unique voice right from the very start. Skeets Bolivar played their final gig on Boxing Day 1978. And Michael followed a solo career in London, releasing his first album, The Midas Touch, in 1980. The early ones I still like. The Midas Touch wasn't really fully maybe him, but there was a lot, not an awful lot about that record. I liked, I liked it at the time. It was kind of like a record at a time. People were doing a different thing musically. One song from the album that has stood the test of time is Take Me Out Drinking Tonight. Everyone seems to, to know this song and talk about it a lot. It's been sung at weddings and funerals and New Year parties and, and all kinds of things. Um, and we've been playing with it with him in the past few years. Michael had his own ideas about what the follow-up to the Midas Touch might be, but his ideas didn't chime with his London management and record company. They wanted songs that they could sell that would be, you know, big hits and all the rest of it, and they didn't really want Scottish songs. But Michael's idea was exactly that, 
an album of songs inspired by and about Scotland. They just threw the idea out, but I, I decided to move back to Scotland completely and, and commit myself to the album. Gills Blue, that was called. It's his take on the Scottish experience and bits of history. And there's a great song on it called General Grant's Visit to Dundee. A carriage was called to the Magdalen Green before the darkness fell. With a short stop over for the ladies' convenience at the Royal Hotel. General Ulysses Grant had visited Dundee, but the only thing anybody could remember him saying was, it's a mighty long bridge. And Michael took that line and made this whole song out of it. Not a pretty little bandstand or a lovely little steeple or charming little houses or cheerful little people. But what a mighty long bridge to such a mighty little old town. I remember being really young and being in the car driving somewhere with Dad and asking him what he thought the best song he'd ever written was. I didn't really expect him to answer, but he did. And right away he said, Monkey Hair. Monkey Hair, the turn to fair, skirts the brow of passion's furrow. This she cries, let no man's lies move through my womb and add to my sorrow. And I think because it was written for a woman to sing, um, he never got to perform it live. And as it's the best song he thinks he ever written, I think we should be singing it a lot more. Send my love to distant hill, all to raise his drooping shares, encasing my heart in monkey hair. One thing that a lot of people say about the singers that come from Dundee is that they are full of soul. When they deliver a song, it's given with integrity and compassion and it's given with 100% commitment. I think Mick was saying, the life here is, is every bit as glamorous and exciting and full of mystery and fun as it is in Hollywood. Gales blue. We've been weighed up and found to be true Though we never had the Chevys or the Baptist church We had a choice of colours for a broken crutch Real blue And that's really what Gales Blue is about, is saying, that, you know, it doesn't have to be London or New York or, you know, the Deep South. It's the same thing is true is true here. Gales blue. We're blue. Gales blue was recorded in Dundee on Michael Mara's own label and all his subsequent albums were produced in Scotland. Mick was always drawing. He's a great visual artist as well. It didn't matter what the medium was. Mick would be making pictures out of sticks and branches and fishing line and things like that. And at his own house, he built a, a kind of a boat out of sticks and branches and all the rest of it in his back garden. It was a kind of escape for him. He would come out here and spend hours placing these sticks, some of them absolutely tiny, to make this boat. These sticks are from all over, really, all over the country. And people would bring him sticks because they knew that he'd be out in the garden building his boat. I think he imagined it was going to be a giant ship in a bottle. Um, so where these strings come from, I think he imagined that he was going to pull it and the whole thing was going to rise up. He lived his life creatively. And whether or not he was planting out a football field in Blue Bells, um, a kind of thing that Ian Hamilton Finlay or George Wiley would have been proud of. You know, he, he was in a Scottish tradition of artists. He just was creative every second that he was alive. I, then I, I, then why nobody in the bar? One of Michael's longest creative collaborations was with one of Scotland's best-kept secrets, Dundee's own St Andrew, with 
and without the woolen mill. Keep on going, back to bed, the pure from what we fed. Wow, tell you back away, getting off for Blair. That was very, very funny. It was a very simple thing. You do American songs, Scots. Scots songs, American. That you'd introduce Pinball Wizard saying, This is a song I sang new from one of my favourite bands, The Hoa. With the St Andrew, he was able to write, you know, with a tongue in cheek kind of thing. Ordinarily, it's much more difficult to do as a, as a kind of straight you know, together, organised songwriter. Mick was able to spot any kind of, like, a rubbish line in a song or a rubbish, even melodic or harmonic line or anything like that, like, in a heartbeat. You couldn't throw anything past them that was sort of contrived. There had to be genuine commitment to the work. Come away, man. Michael's artistic world broadened into theatre, where his songs like this one for the Mill Lavies at Dundee Rep raised production values and often the roof. She, she. If Dundee was Africa and Fife was Antarctica, if Arbroath was India and Perth was Peru. Michael wrote the music for the Rep's wonderfully inventive 1987 production of Witch's Blood, based on William Blaine's novel. Double-deckers of Dundonians travelled the city to watch their fellow citizens in a huge community cast. Michael was the key to it. He was the, the first person with the writer John Harvey, the three of us, would, would go out and we would talk to people across the city and slowly, 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 people started to kind of get involved until we had, I think, six rehearsal rooms in the north, east, south and west of Dundee running concurrently with Michael running from one rehearsal room to another to teach songs. Oh, penitence, oh, penitence, oh, harsh eternity. The monk may hear the devil's hands, the deal himself he sprung for me. To be honest with you, I was led by him. You know, I was completely led by him. If he was okay with things, then I was okay. Because he had the complete authenticity that I was searching for. Oh, penitence! Ah, oh, penitence! He set me up in the belief that to make great theatre, you have to have love and you have to have roots. And that's what Michael gave me. He, he taught me that. Yup, you did! Yes! Michael considered A Wee Home From Home his best theatre work. This two-hander was created together with dancer and choreographer Frank McConnell. The first time I saw Michael was 10 yards from where I'm sitting right here. But almost immediately I thought, I want to work with him. Come in, come in, it's nice to see you. How's yourself, you're looking grand. People still kind of find it hard to believe that that show was created in two weeks. I know. He wrote every single one of those songs <clears throat> in a two week period. Yeah, by accident. And just his vision of Michael in the shower <clears throat> afterwards, <clears throat> standing in the shower with a cigarette. He's the only man <laughs> I ever met who could smoke while having a shower. <laughs> 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 it was like this. It was like that. Aye, how's it going, Jenny? How's it going? <laughs> just up in the shower. In the second city of the earth, Mother Glasgow nurses all her queens. The famous song from it, Mother Glasgow. Mm -hmm. um, Which you wanted to ditch. <laughs> did, did I want to ditch it? I can't remember. <laughs> <coughs> um. <laughs> Dream that took a dander with St Mungo To try to catch a fish that couldn't swim We used the Daily Record as source material every single morning. Yeah. And it, there was an article about <laughs> a minister the Western Isles, using the phrase, we will not 
lead our own children up to heaven <clears throat> if we let them dance their way into hell. <laughs> which Michael being the wordsman, <clears throat> uh -huh. he was, managed yeah. to make it far more poetic than that. <laughs> but he would make us all the way up to heaven By watching all his charges into hell I think it's one of the great uh, songs about cities that I've ever heard and I've ever sung. We've played it all around the country. Mother Glasgow watches all her way and it's the song they all cheer for. And a lot of the sort of more intimate gigs that um, we get hired to do anywhere in the world, that's always on the list. Can the song be stripped down to one voice and one instrument? And all of his work passed that test. Glasgow may have been a wee home from home for Michael, but he was first and foremost a Dundonian. I read once, you know, Ian Hamilton Finlay, somebody asked him about Scotland, and he said that Scotland was a shadow across his heart. <laughs> well, Dundee is, you saw the light outside, you know what the light is like here? Well, Dundee is like a light across my heart. I suppose I listened to Michael thinking, or not even knowing that he was a Dundonian. You know, and I mean, of course, once you start to realise that, then that just comes through in the fervour of his writing and his character and everything is so Dundonian. But I suppose it's, it transcends that. It can speak to people internationally. It can speak to people in Glasgow. Where he was, was as important as anywhere. And I think that was what was important to him. It wasn't, there wasn't a hierarchy of places. And it wasn't that Dundee was some sort of uh, provincial town, it was the centre of the universe. Michael never ever wanted to escape from it. It was a real grounding place for him. Yeah. He, he still had a kind of pride in his heart. Mm. Like he was unbelievably proud of being given a doctorate by his university mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. for a guy that mm. left school with no qualifications. And uh, I was, uh, he was thrilled with that. We were both made doctors of Caledonian University. I was really, really proud to share the platform with Michael Mara. But the only thing that I was really disappointed about was I thought he might have worn these slippers. Because every time I've seen him perform, I've always seen him with these fantastic baffies, the real Urwilly baffies. And so when I saw him in the morning, I was going, have you brought your slippers? And he went, no, I thought I'd leave it. And I thought, oh. I would love, I would so have loved to have seen him with the kind of very distinctive kind of hat like a pancake and a very long <laughs> gown and these baffies. Now that would have made me laugh. Um, but he had on his quite, uh, quite a sort of decent brogue, I think. We were all flooded with a scarlet light Came through the window with the rain outside It all went quiet and a vision appeared with a rose in her hair and a ring in her ear. Definitely, he sung beautiful words that belong to where he came from, but that just made it more enriched. Hit your lift upon this falling star. Make your way down to the Tay Bridge Bar. There'd be no more lies and no more tears. No more listening through the fat man's ears. He was a universal writer, no just like Burns is, you know, just like Shakespeare is, just like, you know, anyone, Bernard Shaw, you know, he, he, he was able to capture the human condition in very succinct and clear ways, you know. Just change the accent and you've got somebody from Manchester, you change the accent, you've got somebody from Kentucky. It's not beyond everybody's reach to get this. Sweetest tours that ever I spent, I spent among the lassies. Oh. Michael Mara was always of that kind of burn singer that I really enjoyed, taking it away from the highbrow and making it a little bit more uh, of the ordinary, singing it. You know, not that he was ordinary, he was extraordinary. Green The final verse where he talks about God being a woman, 
I find that just incredible. All nature swears the lovely dears Our noblest work she classes all Apprentice hand she tried on man Then she made the lassies all I mean, to say such a thing in his time, the time that he was living, was very, very brave and he's a, he's a great man and I, I love the song, I just, I just love it, it's full of love. The sweetest tours that ever I spent I've spent among the lassies old There's a secret osprey nest in Angus. He used to go to it daily, and, and it would either be myself or Andrew, St Andrew, that would go and take him along sometimes, the pair of us, and we would go along and spend some time sitting, looking at this nest and looking at the fledgling osprey uh, as it grew over the time that it was here. Right up to the point until the nest was abandoned and the family migrated. And there's the miracle of life right there, happening right there in front of your eyes. I think towards the end, life in, in any form, uh, became much, much more precious. And I think you could see that, and I think there was a celebration of that through the Ospreys. And there was silence, Michael. Not even a whisper of rustling leaves. The wind dropped, and just one great leaf took an age to come spiralling to the ground in perfect silence. Till suddenly, a honking and a ragged V of urgent birds Wings beating in double time, forming and reforming as they went, their flock-perfect travelling shape as best they could as they crossed the whole wide sky above the osprey's nest in no time. And I don't know if it was an optimistic sound or not, but anyway, it was the sound of being alive, and they were making it. Wild geese coming back from their far cold wherever, to winter here, as if they were ospreys, and Angus was Africa. Apart from being a songwriter and a musician of incredible caliber, probably the uh, consistently highest that I've ever worked with, yeah, I would say that he was a lot of fun to be with. Be my hand on my head. And my hair then One of my favourite things was just watching TV with my dad, which was <laughs> listening to him was more entertaining than what was on, you know. My feet make the back, but the insects are safe. Michael always used to cheer me up every time I heard him play and sing. I'm just at the point of, of missing him, and I think eventually, um, well, he'll not be forgotten. Just a privilege to have known him. I'm sure his family are extraordinarily proud of him, as we should be in Scotland and beyond. I was near there if I did.